Welcome to the Counselor Soapbox video channel. This episode, Drug Counseling Part 4, covers treatment planning. Treatment planning for substance use disorder counseling is based on the chronic disease framework. We know that we can send someone to detox and within 72 hours, the drugs are out of their system. But a week, a month, even a year later, people may pick up and start to use again. So we need to work on planning to prevent these future relapses. In the course of our treatment planning, we identified the problems. We want to rank the problems needing resolution, agree on both immediate and long-term goals, decide on the treatment methods, and pick the resources to use. Treatment in drug and alcohol counseling is somewhat different from what is done in mental health. In substance abuse counseling, we need to look not only at the treatment we will be providing, but our plan will include listing and working on problems whether our particular agency will be treating them or not. This is the difference between a treatment plan or master treatment plan versus a plan of care. In many settings, the plan of care is written specifically for what this counselor or therapist will be doing and does not include other things that are on the case management plan. But in drug and alcohol, our master treatment plan is likely to include things that the client will be referred out for and we will need to keep track of whether they are doing, such as attending uh, sessions with a medical doctor or an outside mental health therapist. TAP 21 provides a useful definition of treatment planning. It is a collaborative process. It includes a written document which identifies important treatment goals. They must be measurable, time-sensitive action steps, and we need to know what are the expected outcomes. Verbal agreement with the client and the counselor is often captured on paper. There are minimum issues that need to be covered in treatment. Substance use disorders must be addressed. Another thing that must be addressed is reasons for the referral. If the client was sent by CPS, parole, probation, or other court-ordered program, we need to make sure that our treatment plan includes all of the requirements that the court or other referral source is imposed on the client. A drug and alcohol treatment plan may include a number of other issues besides substance abuse. Even if these are outside your scope of practice and you will be referring the client to other providers for these issues. Relationships need to be looked at because they are a frequent source of relapse. Mental health issues need to be addressed also. Employment, education, and spiritual issues may be included and physical health concerns will also be included in your plan of things the client needs to be working on. Some other issues that may need to be addressed. Social relationships with family and friends. Social skills also affect job and employment. Legal issues if the client had them and financial issues. Not often considered, but probably important to look at or developmental or lifespan stage. You'll see different issues for clients who have young children as opposed to your clients who have already uh, launched their children. The children have turned 18 and left the house. Older clients who may be approaching retirement age might also have a different set of lifespan issues they're dealing with. More on treatment planning. Treatment planning occurs after the assessment. What you find out during the assessment should drive the issues that are placed on the treatment plan. They should also refer to specific strengths and weaknesses you've identified for this client. A written treatment plan is an administrative requirement and without a written treatment plan, programs may not get paid for providing the services. 
There's some other reasons that you need a treatment plan to meet legal requirements, to meet ethical requirements, and uh, as a guide to practice in treatment. How long is a treatment plan good for? Well, that depends on the legal requirements in the program. I've seen programs uh, use a treatment plan for as long as two years if the client's needs were relatively stable and the treatment was ongoing. In substance abuse, it's far more likely that the treatment plan will be written for the length of the treatment episode. If someone is in residential treatment, they're likely to have a 90-day treatment plan or a 30-day if that's the length of their episode. It's also common in drug and alcohol counseling to review the treatment plan at the beginning of each month and to update it or revise it as necessary. So yes, during treatment, a treatment plan should be revised whenever the client has had a change in their situations. So in answering the question, how long is it good for? The best answer is, it depends. In practice, treatment plans and the forms they're written on can vary widely. Use the form that the particular agency or program you're working for requires. But the simplest form should require problem statements. What problem does the client need to work on during this treatment episode? Goals. How will we know when things are better? Objectives are what the, will the client and the program do together to make these things better. And the completion date needs to be specified. When should all this be done? Not everything the client will need to work on will necessarily be in the initial treatment plan. Their needs are prioritized and worked on as possible. What about problems that are not on the treatment plan? Some problems will not get worked on during the current treatment episode. They may be dealt with after the treatment ends or the client may be referred out for other treatment. Examples of this might be a client has financial issues, unpaid fines or fees, or past due bills. While in treatment, they may not be able to do anything about this. But after the initial sobriety is achieved and they have found employment, then they will begin to develop a plan for that. Also, the client may have physical or emotional issues that need to be treated and they may need to be referred out for those other kinds of treatment. One thing the counselor has to be careful of is in creating a treatment plan and then telling the client to sign it. If the client's not in agreement with what you're trying to do, it's not likely to be very helpful to the client. So some of the uh, items that are on the treatment plan need to get the client's agreement. You may do this through negotiating. You know, if you want a certificate saying you finish our program, you will need to complete X, Y, and Z. Some of it involves building a relationship. In other sections in this series, we will talk about motivational interviewing, how to get the client to state what they want and to help you to help them meet those goals. And you want to work on as many solution-focused strategies as possible. Avoid nebulous things like feel better and set very specific goals on what they will need to do in order to feel better. What are the skills that the counselor will need to develop to do treatment planning? One is the ability to explain the assessment results. What did you find out and what does that mean? You need the skill to identify client problems, to rank problems from those needing to be worked on first to later on, deciding what can be accomplished in this initial treatment episode. The treatment plan should also accommodate client preferences. The goal of the counselor should be to identify and prioritize goals as short-term, intermediate, and long-term and identify treatment resources that the client may use, including the program that they're in, but also including other treatment resources. 
So you're dividing these resources between inside your agency and those resources that are outside your agency. What are some of the possible resources in your agency? Most agencies include individual counseling, group counseling, educational classes, and possibly family sessions which revolve around the issues that have been created by drug and alcohol use. There may also be specialty groups which could include parenting, anger management, job search, and dealing with issues of grief and loss. If there's a service your client needs that your agency doesn't provide, you may make a referral. I think it's important to learn the difference between referrals and linkages. Referrals are typically a written list of providers that the client might go to. Ideally, there should be at least three choices. When you give that client the list, the client needs to make contact and then report back on the results. Sometimes the client and the counselor need to work together to establish this connection to the outside provider. Then we do something called a linkage. The client is connected directly to this other provider by the counselor. The counselor may assist the client in calling and the client has a firm appointment to access services. To do this, you need to get a release of information. Remember, when making referrals or linkages, that you still need to be very aware of confidentiality. If you refer, you still must maintain confidentiality by letting the client make the contact and getting a release or consent to release information form filled out and signed by your client. It's important to have certain information on the release or the consent to release information. You need your client's name, birth date, the releasing agency's name and address, and the receiving agency's name and address. Specific instructions on what is to be in, uh, released. You also should state the purpose of the release, an expiration date, the event or condition for this release to expire. For example, a release might be good for a year or until the client is no longer in treatment with you. Anything that you want to be binding on the client requires the client's signature and it should include the date signed. There are reasons why a release might not be revocable. Generally, releases can be revoked at any time by the client, but a criminal justice release of information cannot be released until a stated length of time has gone by. Once the client tells you to provide information to the court or probation, you can't take it back. And as a result, that criminal justice release of information will remain binding generally for two years. Referrals involve legal and ethical duties. The counselor has a legal and ethical duty to refer a client to providers for other services they may need. Uh, and so you look at what are the client's needs that your agency cannot meet what's outside your scope of practice. You must be able to explain why you are making the referral to, and the referral must match the client's needs to available resources. Remember, a referral is not the same thing as consultation. A referral is for services you do not perform. Consultation, for example, calling the doctor, to find out what the results of the doctor's visit were is to get information you do not have. You may refer someone out to another provider, perhaps a mental health professional, and then you may need to consult with that person afterwards in order to see how to best help this client. But keep the two functions, referral and consultation, separate. 
What are some of the common referrals you might make? You might refer your client for medical issues, psychiatric issues, therapy, financial issues, legal issues. You might refer them to a general GED program or a continuing education program. They might also be referred uh, to the college in California, community colleges typically have a DSPS, Disabled Students Program and Services. Many of your clients may have uh, certain disabilities, mental health or other, that may provide them additional assistance in getting through college and advanced education. You may also need to refer your client for parenting classes, domestic violence classes, batterers treatment classes, and crime victims assistance programs. It's important for the drug and alcohol counselor to understand consultation. I mentioned it earlier when I talked about referrals, but the IC and RC defines consultation as relating with counselors and other professionals in regard to client treatment services to assure comprehensive quality of care. TAP 21 includes consultation as part of service coordination. Consultation, who might you consult with? Well, part of consultation is discussing the case at staff meetings or a treatment team meeting with other people who may be working with the same client. You might also consult, uh, discuss the case with your immediate supervisors. There's a thing called peer consultation in which one counselor would discuss the case with other counselors. You might also consult with a religious person or a spiritual advisor. Outside of your agency or outside of the uh, counseling profession, common referrals and consultations are to, with psychiatrists, mental health therapists, medical doctors, dentists, uh, legal issues such as parole, probation, and you might consult with vocational rehabilitation services. Some things to know about consultation. The client is not usually present. Generally, you will tell the client you are consulting. Let the client know the consultation is for their benefit. In consulting, you don't always have to discuss your particular client. You can still maintain confidentiality, but ask about a client with a particular mental illness or if you had a client with a particular legal issue. If you're going to need to disclose specific information, then you're going to need a release. When will you need a release or a consent to release information to do a consultation? Well, within your own agency, it's not needed. You're discussing an client who is a client of the agency. You should only consult with people in, in the client's treatment team. So just because someone else that works at the same place as you work is interested in what's going on with the client, you wouldn't discuss it with them. Even when you do release information within an agency, you want to release the minimum amount of information. It sometimes comes up if uh, a person who works at the program knows this per client of yours from another setting, from being in a relationship or knowing them uh, from self-help groups. You don't want to tell someone information about your client unless they will be actively working with that client. You will need releases for consultation between agencies and typically the release, the consent to release information, will say that you can send information to another agency and that you can receive information from them. The client may need to uh, tell you why uh, they want this release and specify what's to be released. Otherwise, you will need to remove all client identifying data, age, sex, gender, anything that might be too specific and let the person you're consulting with identify that person. 
we had a case here in, in my area where a person was from a very, very small town. Even reporting their zip code probably would have identified that person. So that had to be removed. But whenever you consult, you should tell the client that you're doing it and why this consultation is for their benefit. What are some of the reasons why you might need to consult? Well, something may come up which is outside your knowledge base or outside your scope of competency. Now, scope of competency is separate from scope of practice. So while you may be legally able to work on the issue, if it's outside your scope of competency, you don't have the experience or knowledge needed to work on that issue. You could also consult to increase your skills or to get details on another program or agency that could help your client. What's ahead for the Counselor Soapbox video channel? More in our Learning About Drug Counseling series, more drug education videos, and a series on mental health and wellness. If you've enjoyed this video, please click the like button directly below. For more information, please visit the CounselorSoapbox.com blog, where you will find articles on mental health, substance abuse, and having a happy life. The David Joel Miller fiction and nonfiction books are available on Amazon.